Okay. <clears throat> well, let's get started. So for people who are joining us on the live stream, this is another episode in our effort to design chemistry functionality for orphan language. And previously, we had mostly been talking about how to input a molecule. And I think we're largely finished with that. At least that's the theory. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so where do we want to start looking today? Let's see. Um, do we want to look at the options? Or this, uh, right, so that's... Okay. Yeah. Um, right, so one thing that, that was different that we, from what we discussed before, uh, we have atom positions and structure diagram coordinates. You can have 3D or 2D coordinates. And so here, um, you can put automatic, you can give specific, or uh, you can uh, give a method, give method options to, to generating the, the coordinates. Hmm, okay. I don't think it should be method options though. I think it should be just, uh, maybe that's a string or a function that specifies how you should do it. I don't think we want to, um, I mean, what, what is the right-hand side of the method option? Right, so uh, <clears throat> so it would be a list of rules, I believe, is what I've seen in, a, like, graph layout would, has things like that. Method right, but that's to... a method option. I mean, as opposed to... This is specifically... In, what are you saying? This is for automatic layout, right? Right, so, <clears throat> but then you could say for the automatic layout, I want it to be... Um, in canonical form where you, you put the long axis horizontal to the, uh, uh, to the x-axis or you um, <clears throat> make it re resemble another structure. Um, All right, so there, there are a bunch of detailed options then. Yes. As opposed to the pure quantity array. But even if you've got the quantity array, might, might you not want to, you know, organize it like which way the axis goes and where you want the... Um, I mean, if you don't, you want to be able to specify, you know, lots of things like even where the baseline is. If you have multiple molecules in a list and so on, you might want to say where the um, uh, how you want to line them up vertically, things like that, right? I mean, that's a question of how the display. It's a question of how the display works, right? It's not so much the coordinates as how it's embedded in the outside. I mean, okay, so there are a bunch of different issues there. You know, there's a bunch of things about baseline alignment and so on, which are what you would see. I, I don't know if graph has those things. Certainly grid would have those things. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, right. Graph have those. I mean, we split the coordinate, we have the layout, and then we have all the graphic uh, options. to control Oh, okay. The and such. So sh show me that, Charles. Oh, gosh. Is this broken on? Wait a minute. Is this Is this a new version? Hold on. Um, okay, so those are all those things. And then where is? So there, just upstairs, so we say we support all the graphic options with the following additional changes. I see. So so this could do the same thing though. Right. Is that right? I mean, I, I whew, yeah, I guess. Um, But so, this question, so, go ahead, go ahead. Well, with, so with graph, you can supply, so it splits those into two, two separate ones. You can supply vertex coordinates, but then you could also uh, give a graph layout where you can, you can give a named uh, layout algorithm or, and with those named layout or algorithms, you can then give sub options, although I don't know that those are documented. Okay, so we've got vertex coordinates and then we've got graph layout. So we might want to have a structure diagram layout that's analogous to the graph layout thing and that gives all of those details. And then we could say, um, I mean, we could do that. Structure diagram layout and structure diagram coordinates as two separate options. That makes sense? Yes. Um, okay. Stereo elements. That has a, a, a nasty sort of potential um, 
kind of too general a name for what it is. Can we can we um, stereochemistry elements or something? Stereochemical elements, just to give some idea if somebody sees that just out in the wild, what the heck it is. I mean, you could just say stereochemistry goes to. I don't know how Bob would feel about that. Yeah, uh, stereochemistry is finer stereochemistry elements. Uh, I, I would stereochemistry. prefer stereochemistry elements. Stereochemistry is sort of a field. I mean, it's. I know yeah. people use it as a slang to mean the stereochemistry of a of a molecule, but I think that's some. Um, okay. Seems yeah. so. Stereochemistry elements seems like the right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is now the stereochemistry specification here. Yeah, and these are just some examples that I, we had put together. Uh, the The first one was for a stereo center. We, uh, in the last notebook, um, not all the fields were filled in. So here's a, a concrete example with all of the uh, the fields filled in, the fiducial atom, the ligands, and the direction indicating uh, whether or not it's going to essentially be clockwise or counterclockwise. So hold on a second. So this is just saying... I'm I'm confused here. Okay. Um, oh, so there are two real examples here: uh, you know, the the trihalo methane and uh, the the stick figure for the last one is numbering the atoms so that we can specify the. the okay, that's just a fake there. Yeah, that's just a fake. Um, but this is what it should be. Is that what you said? This is what it would, the specification would be in the molecule object with these atoms numbered in this way. So the stereo center is the central atom, which is number one, the fiducial atom, which is our reference atom, that to, you know, it, indicating the direction that we're looking toward the central, the uh, stereo center atom. Okay. And then the ligands are uh, atoms three, four, and five. And the direction uh, for the handedness in this case is counterclockwise. Oh yeah, but so so what we discussed before is this is great for carbons that are four, you know, have valence four. But what happens with things with valence five and so on? Uh, that's a work in progress. I just got the papers uh, from our library, and I'm going to begin looking at those to see how okay. they're handled. Okay, fine. So probably what will happen is direction will become something more elaborate in that case. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Hey, we have a comment from the live stream about atom positions and why we're not calling that atom coordinates. So, well, so I was using atom coordinates uh, last time uh, you made the comment. They're, they're not really coordinates, they're the positions. I, don't, I didn't quite understand the, the distinction. Um, well, the question is, okay, coordinates are in what, the structure diagram coordinates are in what coordinate system? Just the, the coordinates of the, the graphics frame. So the it's just a 2D uh, Yeah, but depiction. it's like 0, 1 or something. What, what, let's ask Charles. For a graph, what is the coordinate system for vertex coordinates? So it's the standard, you know, R2 or R3 coordinate system. So we can give any arbitrary position in the, the space, R2 or R3. What, what, you um, also support R3? Yes. For graph 3D. Graph 3D. Okay, but not for graph. Um, yes. I mean... What does the S mean? I mean, does, in other words, in, in a graph, if I start giving 3D coordinates, what's it going to do? Pop out into space, or is it going to uh, give an it, error? It, it will actually do, uh, draw it in 3D. Oh, okay. Well, but only if, it's a, if it has the graph 3D head, right? Or am I... No, there is... We the, the graph 3D head doesn't exist. There is just ah. a graph head. Okay. Graph okay. So so the way that, that, that this was done is that graph 3D is to emphasize the 3D nature. And the fact that it works in graph two, we don't advertise that okay. at all. Just a luxury. Okay. So what about is, is the planar graph? Does it is it the same type of thing? Right. It's just specified the layout. But right. So planar graph is just feeding into graph as well. So graph is the main workhorse function here. Yes. Okay. So what we're dealing with then is they're arbitrary kind of uh, computational coordinates for the vertex coordinates there, right? Yes. Um, and then the 3D coordinates have, uh, are attached to a unit system. 
Uh, right, but I mean, the 3D coordinates are relative to what? Are they relative to the center of mass or they're relative to what, whatever we feel like, so to speak? Right, they are. It is arbitrary. I mean, we, we put the center of mass at, at zero at the origin. Okay, but but so but then also it's arbitrary what the orientation of the coordinate system is. Correct. Yes, but I mean we have a canonicalization. Uh, that no, we... I understand. But if if we're going to, so my question is, but then you might want to draw a molecule with a particular orientation with particular coordinates. Yep. And I'm now completely confused about whether these are the relative. I mean, there are effectively relative coordinates, and then there are absolute coordinates. Put this molecule at this position on in 3D space, right? Mm -hmm. Although there isn't a... So, in a sense, I mean, the notion of atom coordinates would be put them at these absolute... at this. Okay, here's my question. If, if we've got something where we're combining two molecules... Do they, how do they draw themselves? Do they look at if, if their coordinate systems sort of, uh, you know, inter, interpose themselves, that's going to be goofy. I mean, really, it, it, the molecule, okay, help me out here. What, what, what do we do with graphs in this regard? If, if you give two graphs, you, you can't throw two graphs into the same pot, can you? How, if you do a graph union, for example, what happens to the graph coordinates? So current, currently we just reset the coordinate and we use automatic methods. So that's essentially the something we plan to work on, which is the you know inheritance of property, which is you know quite complex in general. And it doesn't limit itself to just coordinates. So, so if I say graph union, how, how would I do this? If I if I give multiple graphs like of this. Multiple instances of this. How would I do that? A disconnected graph with three copies of this. Yes. So you, yeah, you put three copy. Oh, sorry. You should remove the list. What? That's not so, doing what I thought it was doing. That that's that's taking each one with its named coordinates, right? Uh, yeah, the one you want is graph disjoint union. So it's, uh, okay, well, fine. That's okay. Okay, fine. So that's just placing them arbitrarily. Yes. Okay. So what will be the analogous thing for molecules? Right. So, so if you do a molecule plot and then give a list of molecules, um, by default, I was thinking to move them uh, like just like graph disjoint union, out, uh, move them by the amount of their bounding box. Okay. Yeah, but the graph disjoint union makes a new single graph object and molecule plot, the molecule plot 3D doesn't do that. And this right. is kind of related to what we were talking about at the end of the last session about creating ensembles or clusters. Yes. Yeah. I mean, so so show would just blast them on, right? It would right. Not try to, to change things. Um, that doesn't make a lot of sense. You, we have a more specific scenario here, you know, and so what, um, you know, what are useful behavior in that case, in, in our case? Right. So, for example, do we have move a molecule, like move its center of mass? So, so geometric transformation would, would work with on molecule is what I was thinking, like in all of the, all of the geometric transformations. I see, to rotate to whatever else. Right. Roger, does that make sense to you? Yeah. And, and what about the, when you talk about a rotate, you know, the natural center is the center of mass for the molecule. Is that representable easily with rotate? See what I'm asking? I mean, in other words, right. do we definitely have rotation mass? transform, but you designed rotate, so let's see. But those, those rotation are purely for geometric or graphic object, right? You know, overloading them, I mean, I'm not sure that's the right thing to do here. Well, a geometric okay. transform is more general, and you can write that basically to be uh, whatever your fixed point is that you want to use. You can specify that it's a rotation around an axis 
in this direction with a given point on that axis. Actually, rotate does that too now. Rot so, yeah. So the, it, it inherited those. Yes. Um, so currently, geometric transformation is is made for is typically used on graphics objects, but I don't see anything in the the documentation that says it should only be used on on graphics objects. So. I was thinking to overload it, but if if it's if that's not preferable, we could have a molecule transformation that takes the same transformation functions that geometric transformation takes. Yeah, I mean the word molecule transformation sounds kind of funky because it's like uh, you know some would sound more general about the molecule, but I think having something which takes look, uh, Roger. I mean, don't you have this issue with I mean with regions and things, things like rotate and so on, just work? Is that correct? They are starting to just work now. Okay. So, and and with a region, is there also this issue about having, I mean, to me, that seems like both region and molecule need to have this kind of default rotation center that might be the center of mass or something like this. Well, no. Yeah, in, a, my no. Past, in my past experience with molecules, the coordinates are absolute and if you just gave it a you know a three by three rotation matrix, it would assume it's being rotated, you know, around the origin as okay. a fixed point. Yeah, I, I don't think so because then, then you're gonna write the documentation and you're gonna say the default rotation center is here for this, and then you know it's like endless. Okay, but 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 so but Roger, it's clearly going to be useful if you've got a you know a um a rubber duck or something represented as a region, right? Being able to turn the thing upside down relative to its center of mass is clearly going to be a useful operation. Um, or a teapot, whatever you want to pick. Mm -hmm. right? In other words, there are plenty of applications for which it would be useful to, by default, rotate around the center of mass. And there should be an easy way to do that. I mean, I think with rotation transform, you can specify a rotation center, can't you? Yes. Right. Um, Yeah. yeah, it would be a little long winded, I think, but it, it you should be able to construct that transform without a lot of difficulty. By long winded, I mean, you know, long no, 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 absolutely. No, I'm, I'm just wanted to think some more about what the consequences yeah. are of all that. Um, but yes, we got to make that easy. That's for sure. OK, but so in this case, the real question is what you are specifying in this molecule thing, really what you want to specify what you might want to specify is, oh gosh, either the relative positions relative to the center of mass, or you might want to specify the orient the position of the center of mass and the orientation of the molecule, or you might want to specify absolute atom positions that came out of some molecular dynamics code or some such other thing that might have been molecular dynamics code running on a multi-molecule cluster. Did that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so for automatic coordinates, uh, I mean, for automatic uh, coordinate generation, the, we would we would put the center of mass at the origin. If you provide okay. the the coordinates, then 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 they're whatever you say they are. Yes. Okay. And still, uh, well, okay. Uh, relative to the center of mass, um, there's still the the overall orientation in space. You know, w which direction sure. is. So well, the question here is whether why we're calling it atom positions rather than atom coordinates. I kind of think that, but we've actually got two different things. So the atom coordinates could be relative coordinates, or they could be absolute coordinates. Well, I mean, they're just some set of coordinates that you give. And then the issue is, how do we uh, inherit those when you have a cluster that has multiple molecules in it? Well, so so then when you do that, when you uh, union them, or uh, when you do mole, I, I don't know what the function will be. I was thinking molecule add, but there could be molecule union. I suppose I don't. Um, but there would be a default behavior there. Whereas in if they um, <clears throat> where they would be moved, where their bounding boxes don't overlap, but you could override that behavior. Yes. Well, I mean, okay, so there's one, but you're going to have the exact same issue for graph as we've just discussed, right? Oh, do you put, when you combine graphs with graph disjoint union, do you put them, do you, uh, 
reset. I mean, in other words, what you could imagine is saying in graft disjoint union, having vertex coordinates arrow inherited means use the original vertex coordinates and vertex coordinates arrow automatic means automatically set new ones. Charles, Roger, what do you think of that? Yeah, that's correct. That's actually the design we are planning to implement for Great. inheritance of properties. Great. Well, so that should work here as well. So then it will be atom coordinates arrow inherited versus atom coordinates arrow automatic for the combiner function. Make sense? Yep. Yes. And so, so we'll move. We'll change that to atom coordinates. The, uh, so. the molecule yeah. option. Okay. Okay. Thank you. To, I. You know, the problem with people on live stream is that I don't know how to say their names because. Well, thank you to the person who suggested this. Um, okay, so let's let's keep going for double bonds. What is this about? Well, well, double bonds have a stereochemistry as well. Uh, for a simple double bond, which is the the schematic on the left, uh, that's two butene. Uh, it can be either cis or trans, and. Right. The specification there, Jason and I have been batting around two different ways of doing it. The first one, uh, we you know the the stereotype is now double bond instead of stereo center. We have to specify the two atoms that make up the bond, and then the two ligands that are attached that are either going to be apart or together um, across that bond. So wait a minute, is is this what's usually called cis versus trans? Exactly. Well, why aren't we using those names? Uh, well, cis and trans are an old version. The accepted stereochemistries is E or Z for Entgegen and Zusammen, which are in English are apart and together. I see. So that's well, why we, we should probably accept cis and trans as alternatives. Uh, yes, we we probably can in most cases. Um, why, don't we, why don't we accept all of those, all three of those, both the German? Well, cis, well yeah. e, and Z, e and Z, yes, and Gagan and Tutsaman, yes. Cis and trans, no, because there are some nuances carried over from the old literature that uh, are not specific enough. And that's why they were replaced by E and Z sometime in, in the 60s or 70s. Right, but so the, there's a distinction here. Um, when people usually use the terms E and Z and they talk about stereochemistry, they're talking about uh, absolute stereochemistry. Yes. And what we're trying to, to provide is allowing them to specify the local stereochemistry to determine whether a molecule is E or Z. It, <clears throat> you might in, have in to. A, well, yes, absolutely. And in a local sense, it, it, to, to do it officially, you need to find what the priorities are of the, the four attachments to the double bond. And that means doing the graph search and all this stuff and assigning, you're looking at the atomic numbers all the way out until you can disambiguate everything. This way here, we're keeping it local. We only look at the four things. We're saying the four things have this arrangement and it's you know the absolute uh, arrangement of being either apart or together. So we don't have to trace out the graph to get the the, the Conningal prelog priorities. And so essentially, what we're the way we're having it is you specify the local stereochemistry around a particular bond or a, or a center, and then the absolute stereochemistry, which goes into the name or whatnot, is um, is a computed property. Right. Okay. Okay, and, and then we have, Jason and I had two alternatives here for specifying the double bond. Uh, we could do it the first way, which is more or less the preferred way, where you just specify the two atoms in the bond and then the two attachments, the two ligands, and then the direction. Uh, the second method here is kind of like for stereo centers where we have a reference I don't see why one should, I don't see why you should, you should, I mean, the stereo center thing is going to get blown up anyway with the five five element things. So they're, they're going to be other weird things that right, I, I wouldn't right. try to make it always look the same. Okay, so we can stick with the first one then and not have to try to... I think so. Uh, I wouldn't try and yeah. pretend there's okay. a official atom. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I was just trying to think, you know, what's consistent from case to case versus... Well, know, but I, I, I predict that there'll be other funky cases of stereochemistry that aren't 
you know, that yeah. don't necessarily have a fiducial atom, as you it's, say. Yes, a, yes. I mean, it's a clump of local properties of a graph that might not have a, a king atom, so to speak, in the whole thing. Yep, yep. The, so um, we'll go with the first one for double bonds, and then everything else as far as stereochemistry goes is still on the drawing board. But for the first version, uh, what we have right now for a stereo center and double bonds will be sufficient. Fair enough. Okay, so adjacency matrix of this. Okay, molecule, what is this doing? So this is just uh, an example to show that uh, uh, right now I have everything hooked up as string value Why properties. Why is the adjacency matrix uh, real numbers? What's the 1.5? Uh, so, so there, for uh, an adjacency matrix for a molecule, you might want to have the bond order be the uh, um, uh, the elements. So, or I, I can imagine that they might do that with uh, what edge weights. Five mean? Uh, so that's uh, would be one and a half bonds, an aromatic bond. Yeah. One would be a single bond, two would I be would a double bond. By default, this should be these should be uh, exact numbers. Um, I okay, believe so I was. Trying to to emulate a graph, I might be incorrect about that. No, it appears that I am incorrect about that. Okay. I can't imagine that graph has an adjacency matrix that's real numbers, does it? Yeah. No, I I was wrong. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. All right. So in terms of these bonds, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen with packed arrays and things in terms of well, you're representing it as a sparse array anyway, so that's going to be somewhat okay. Um, in terms of those, I, I didn't, I mean, these aromatic bonds that have half integer valence, so to speak, or half integer, I don't know what you call it, bond order. Bond order. order. Bond order. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll just have to localize the bonds, Jason, to do this. Um, what happens and, to the No, I mean, they could be three halves. That would be fine. I don't see why. Okay. One and, one and a half is a perfectly reasonable exact number. So is that like a weight? Not really, Roger. It, I mean, it's, it's it's when you draw the diagram, right? It's whether it's a double bond or not. And I don't know how you represent these aromatic bonds. There are a couple of nice. ways they do that. Uh, some people draw the ring with a circle in the middle. Uh, some people draw them with, uh, uh, they would draw a hexagon. And then they would, uh, instead of having a solid second line, yeah, right. they would have a dashed line for all of the bonds, so there'd be a solid- Seems more bond. consistent to me than putting the circle in the middle. Right, that's the way I've that's got a molecule plot right now. Yeah, right. The, the, the circle is falling out of fashion. Well, and especially given that one's going to say that they have, you know, then it's kind of nice. It's a, it's a multi-edge that is a one and a half edge, so to speak, which is something that I'm sure Roger and Charles have not considered for graph, for the graph <laughs> theory. No, but we have, we have something that's more general than that, which is weighted adjacency matrix. Okay, so Which, th those weights can be, you know, whatever you want them to be. Right. Yeah, so, and that's great. Great you can have flow. Pi. You know, not not right. only multiples of half, but pi, whatever you want. No, I understand. And so, so when when we ask for adjacency matrix here, it's going to somewhat bizarrely because we live in a quantum mechanical world and all that kind of thing. Give you half integer adjacency stuff out, representing these things like aromatic bonds that are sort of a, if I understand correctly, are sort of a feature of quantum mechanics. Is that a fair statement? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, it's hard to imagine how they would work. Um, but a lot of things, you know, weights, you know, including multigraphs and so on, you know, weighted graphs is, is, is sort of the more general concept. No, I understand, I understand. Okay, let's keep going here. Okay, properties for molecules, so. Multiple properties can be queried returning an association, which probably will spell check if I, um, uh, we've got some background noise. Somebody might want to mute themselves. Um, okay, so that's the smiles and the inchi for that particular molecule. Fine. Is that the default thing that we do is to return an association when we have a list like this there? Let's see. Um, so I think an entity value, it would just return a list. Then that's and you what have we to add. Do. Okay. Then that's what we should do. 
And then, uh, so the uh, adjacent, uh, entity value then has a third argument that is, um, uh, uh, I believe, uh, property association. So, so I'll emulate entity value. I think so. I would think so. Now, what are these? Uh, so, so then these these properties can have attributes. You can ask for the canonical smiles. You could ask for you could even ask for the smiles to start at a particular. Atom. But how does this work with entity value? Does that that, that there are entity attributes, right? I mean, there are property attributes. Right. Are those given? So, I, uh, Michael might uh, uh, correct me on this, but I believe if you're just the, the basically the equivalent would be entity property. That's why I was suggesting to Jason we should have a molecule property where we can have an outer head that would allow to specify all kinds of details without disassociating it into multiple arguments. But if you're doing you just a single like property. You have a code, Michael, am I right? Or am I sorry? Yes, yes, you're right. <laughs> okay. Just checking. Just, yeah. So if you're asking for a single property though and it has attributes, do you need the entity property head or can can it be just like this? It um, can be friendly, but it would be still nice as a syntactic mm -hmm. construct. Right. So I, I mean, so molecule then becomes a thing like an entity. I mean, we've discussed this. We discussed this anyway in great detail. <laughs> yes, right. Go ahead. What were you going to say? I mean, what, what other feature does molecule property, would a molecule property wrapper have other than just keeping these options? It would have the another advantage that we wouldn't be bound to molecule of property, but we could, similar to entity, we could do property of molecule, which in some cases might just read neither. Okay. Right. And you could map a molecule property at over a list of molecules. And Right, that's interesting. Okay, fine. I think that's a direction we should go. But now, what about the, what about when we're doing searches in the same way that we're doing with entity? Um, how does that, you know, how does that relate? So this is like, um, like implicit entity classes. Is that yes. right? I had not. Um, yeah, I, I had not fully considered that. I mean, there might be something different here because. At least conceptually, in the entity world, there's a fixed number of entities we go through and look which yes, was right. Here yeah. we, it's, it's much more a find star-like operation. Yeah, I agree. They, they are not fixed. All right, it's not completely obvious to me, but I would say provisionally a molecule property thing, which can be a wrapper that holds these things, would be a good thing to do. But then, for to be um, to be nice, as Michael said, if you just give that's one fine. property that's and an fine. option, that's fine. That's okay. fine. Yep. But conceptually, those things are part of the molecule property thing, and therefore they don't have to be documented options of their own and things like this. Okay. I don't know what use bond order is supposed to do. Should I be looking at that? I mean, is there a whole? Well, so so is so there. If you ask, for, it would be the difference between the weighted adjacency matrix and the adjacency matrix. If you don't use the bond order, then it would be all ones and zeros for the adjacency matrix. Oh, I misunderstood the word order and was thinking it was you know ordering as in permutation. Um, okay. Well, that's kind of. Icky. I mean, it would be nice then yeah. to say, I mean, by the way, I don't see why you shouldn't have the actual function. I think you, you had that up above using actual adjacency matrix, the function on a molecule. Why not give the thing? Well, so I didn't know uh, if, if we want to overload some of the graph functions for molecules or not. So. I would think so. I don't see a problem in doing that. I mean, there's hardly any confusion there and it seems like a nice thing to do, but it seems to me that we've got to be consistent with adjacency matrix and weighted adjacency matrix. And that we shouldn't, that adjacency matrix should be the zero one matrix. Because for many graph operations, that's exactly what you're going to want. And by the way, I assume that graph of molecule will give the graph of the molecule. Would you want that to be uh, just simple vertices and edges, or would you want it to have essentially weighted edges and, and colored vertices? In other words, the atom types. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I would well, think so, yes. So I think you want I think you want something that you can manipulate with graph operations. Yes, there are a lot of applications for that. So we, we should make that easy. Right. And then mm. on the way back, you should be able to say molecule of graph. And in fact, what I would do is to say molecule of just if I just do it for a plain Jane graph like this, okay. I mean, it's going to probably complain that that's not well. Is is there a way of making that into a hydrocarbon? Uh, that one, yes. Yeah, if you assume uh, uh, it, it, it yeah. would be strained, right. but um... right. But I think that would be a really nice thing to be able to do. To be able to say, given a graph, you can just say molecule of that graph, and it turns into by default a um, uh, you know a hydrocarbon version. If you specify, let's see. I mean, I can imagine you specifying the atoms here and then specifying a graph here for the bonds. Am I making sense? Okay. Yeah. I could see and so that. we want it to go both ways. So we want it, it to be the case that a graph of a molecule gives you a graph that you can then manipulate. And then if you want to get that back into a molecule again at the end, it should be as faithful as it can be, I think. Right. Yes. So, so molecule of a graph will look for the uh, uh, properties. So we'll 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 need to come up uh, when we make a, a graph out of a molecule. We need to come up with names for the properties that, where we give the atom type and everything. I would um, think so. And so then, so first we would look for those properties, and if they weren't there, then we would do as you say and assume an all ca carbon. I think so. Okay. Yeah. The other thing is that they could, be, you know, that's perfectly good. Okay, but if you need to provide additional control over how that mapping is done. And I, you know, maybe you don't see that now, but you might see it later that it's important that the different, but also very important different ways of doing it because they preserve different kinds of properties. Of constructing that, the graph from the molecule. Exactly. Right. And so that, I mean, so there, I would think that you would want to, so right now I would have it as a graph, as a string, as a property of the molecule, and, and it would have option. It could have options, as opposed. To, but uh, but if you if you need to provide control for that, it it and and it's important. Then it needs to be. It should really be a separate function because then you can talk about why do you want to do it this way or that way. You can show why. You know, you can, that's the proper way uh, to. To, to describe it if it needs control if it doesn't so, need control then fine so like a new uh, graph constructor molecule graph for instance yes but the, but that's only if you need to to con, you know if if there's a the added value to do it right you know okay okay so and then finally we're or not finally but now this is a, an important part that I, I'm not certain about the syntax for. You want to be able to, to query for properties, both given or computed, of parts of the, the molecule. I like the syntax of property value with graph, but I've been told that, um, <clears throat> well, so, but I wasn't sure whether whether we wanted to go in that direction. So here, you would have molecule formal charges, atoms goes to five and seven to give you the charges of the seventh and fifth atoms. As opposed to using property value, you do property value list molecule, comma, and then list of vertices, list of edges, and then and then the name of the property. Well, that's just totally obscure, but, but um, okay. By the way, a comment from our live stream encouraging us um, to implement adjacency matrix properly for molecules and not just have it be an up value for molecule. Um, but anyway, that, that's some, um, uh, yes. Um, okay, so, but back to this. So, so you... a fundamental problem in the Wolfram language is that um, where, where you don't want to encourage a lot of things like that, because if you look at the reference page for that, it will be like five different reference pages in one. For this thing, it will do that. For that thing, it will do this. Yeah, I mean, this, okay. So, so, so the documentation is not 
object oriented. It's not sort of permitted, if you see what I'm saying. It's well, sometimes it's, it's it is. Shared. We have, I mean, we have separate pages for some, like for the entities and properties. We for you know for entity types, we are having separate pages, so we can do that if there are enough of them. But you know, I, I'm I'm still trying to understand what this means. So this is saying, I mean, the fact that this formal charges thing, like for example, adjacency matrix is its own great big official grown-up function, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's not obvious to me that these things, I don't know how many of these things there are, but it's not obvious to me that this shouldn't be a grown-up function as well. That, you know, if you say, I mean, is it, is it obvious that we shouldn't have a formal charges of molecule and then all the specifications and so on so that it's a proper, you know, first-class thing? I mean, why, why are we hiding it as just some sort of weird access or property of the molecule? How many of these things are there? How many of these... Um, so the properties of a molecule are there. So properties of the molecule or properties of the of the atom. I mean, well, you've you've got okay. So fair enough. Look, look. So so maybe what you're saying here is that, you know, what you're saying is it's something like atom properties mm -hmm. in a molecule for atoms five and seven. This is the property I want. In other words, extract those. It's like a part extractor for molecules five and seven. See what I'm saying? So, so for example, the, the most... That would uh, definitely give much cleaner um, code when you use it. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, so yeah. what about something like molecule part five comma seven? And then there's a third argument, and then by default that just gives you whatever those are, the atom representations for those things. And if you want to get atomic numbers directly, you could say, I mean, I'm not sure that that molecule part is necessarily the right name, but might be. Um, uh, let's see, molecule component, molecule elements or something. That's that's rather a silly pun. And probably not right. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, but um, there's, there's another complication here, Stephen. And if you specify, you know, a handful of atoms, do you also include the bonds among those atoms or not? That's exactly what I was thinking. Because it's, you know, the subgraph would do that, for instance. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, yeah. Well, so then we probably want that. We want atom properties, and we want, you know, submolecule or something. Or a, a substructure. Okay. Um, it would, which would be like the the analogous subgraph um and then there are bond properties okay well i think you know look the world is made of atoms and things so i think we can you know we can justify having a function that represents something about atoms well so but so one, one, one thing he probably will have to add is that we want them to be you know l values so you want to be able to set them so you probably end up with four functions well, not necessarily, because we can say atom properties. If we if we have this be like part, we can make it be settable like part. So, but nomenclature-wise, though, atom properties, does it return the property value? Well, is only that... if, if you say if you have a third argument there, I'm not I'm not necessarily selling that name. Okay, I'm saying that that. Yeah, so I mean that would be with a third argument. Without the third argument, you'd want to specify. Um, I mean, this is. Well, you've got to have the third argument there. Well, you've got to be able to have the third argument there, but without the third argument, this should just return the actual atom symbolic atom objects. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. You are, and and what's included in those uh, symbolic atom objects, uh, Jason? Is it just the atomic symbol, or is it everything we know about those atoms? Right. So it's, it so it certainly wouldn't be. I mean, it could be in a um, a what do you uh, the atom head around an association like that would go into the first part of the molecule. That's what but it there, should be. But yeah. the, but there's an issue, a complication here that certain properties of the atom you. They're, they don't exist on their own. So um, uh, neighbors might be a property of an atom, but it, if you just get, get an, an L value representing that atom, um, it has no neighbors or it has no... Um, okay, yeah. well, the question of, what, of how much, you know, how many hanging loose wires there are 
in the atoms that come out is a is one question. But the second question is, in this case where you just say mole here, I mean, I think this is the right way to go, is to have actual official functions for this. I think we shouldn't try to do this. We should try to do an atom part and a mo mo something like atom part and molecule part or some that doesn't that's not right. Those are not the right names. But the, the concept would be that this is a an actual subgraph of the molecule, right? Whereas atom part is the list of atoms. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that both of them are L valuable, so to speak. So if you want to substitute a single atom, you would basically say atom part of mole comma five equals blah. Equals and then a specification an for an atom, like a, a carbon or a, yeah, yeah, or an entity, right? Yeah. yeah, just as we would an input form. Yeah, I think this is a reasonable way to do it. And then you can also do, you know, a subgraph L value here as well with molecule part. Let's let's take a look here when you've got molecule add, for example. Okay, so that is a thing where you are, it's like an append to for a molecule. Pretty much. Right. How do you do that in the case of, you have a vertex add in the case of a graph, correct? Yes. Okay. So I'd originally proposed atom add, bond add, but uh, the idea is that these can be combined with uh, molecule add. And, that, and if you provide a key, then you can add bonds and... Uh, um, well, also, the new but, I mean, you know what you're adding, because if you add an atom object, if the second argument of molecule add is an atom object, you know you're adding an atom. Right. Um, okay. And that could also be uh, overloaded to combine, I mean, to combine molecules. You could do molecule atom, mol, and then another molecule. Well, I, I okay, but but if it's a, not a molecule that has some hanging valence thingy, how do you add it other than as a cluster? Did that make sense, or is that right? Right. No, yeah. I mean they would be disconnected unless you simultaneously, and then you would could go in next and add a bond or add a bond at the same time, provided that you. Well, but isn't that uh, so? When you add a bond, aren't you overwriting? And I see if you if you add a bond and it is at position. Right, you, you can add a bond. When you say molecule add, gosh, I'm now confused. You, does that also have the potential to overwrite? If you say atom five, in molecule add, if you say atom and then the atom's name is five, then that will go and overwrite atom five. Is that correct? How do you do that in a graph? How do you do that for the, for if you, I want to go to vertex five in a graph, and overwrite it and replace vertex five by some subgraph. How do I do that? We don't replace subgraphs. But we have the. Can you replace a vertex with a, with a graph? We have vertex replaced for that. Okay. Please. As opposed to. So, but molecule add, I don't even understand how you would do that for a molecule. If you've got a complete molecule, you can't add an atom to it. Well, it, some kind of ion thingy. Well, um, traditionally in molecular modeling, what, what this operation would be, would be to replace an existing hydrogen, for example, uh, on an atom by something else. So if you said atom, you know, atom add uh, molecule, okay. comma five, comma chlorine, uh, it's going to replace one of the hydrogens on atom five by a chlorine atom. Okay, so I think that's a molecule replace because it is a replacement operation. It's not. Yes, yes. I, I'm not saying we need to use atom add for it, but you know, from prior modeling systems, that's what chemists came up with for their nomenclature for, of functions. Um, I understand, but I think we yeah. probably should use replace because it's replacing an atom at a particular position with something. Yes, yes. But in some cases that you're only replacing a, um, an implicit atoms. The hydrogens are second class citizens and sometimes they're not even given actual numbers. That's the easiest way okay. to do this. Yeah, there's that, there's that issue as well, whether or not we've got hydrogens actually instantiated. 
Um, but, but aren't they always there? Isn't that just a display property? Or I thought it was. No. Well, I, did we come to a decision on that last time? No, I mean, so they are sometimes always, sometimes there, but sometimes you want a, a, a well, okay. hydrogen suppressed graph. I think there's going to be a way for molecule replace to somehow, either we have to have a separate molecule add from the molecule replace, or we have to, oh, this was supposed to do something. The, um, well, I mean, uh, molecule replace doesn't, won't act to delete an atom. Or I guess I guess it, it, it would in this idea that you're um, deleting a a carbon and replacing it with with hydrogens. I with for functions like these, I, we would ideally want to just treat the the hydrogens uh, automatically. Yes, I understand. Except when you want to replace a a hydrogen, you've got to be able to name that hydrogen, right? How do you say what you're replacing unless you're yeah, oh, so I don't think of it as a replacement. I think of that. Um, so you've got ethane and you add a carbon to it. Sure, you you are technically removing a hydrogen, but I, a lot of times you don't even think about the hydrogens. You you add a carbon and you make a, a propane. It's the reason to, to, to but, make it. But wasn't that, you know, when you don't show hydrogen, isn't that just a sort of an elision technique? You know, it's like... It's easier to handle visually. There's the visual aspect of it, Roger. I, I don't think we we came up with the decision last time about whether or not hydrogens are always present or instantiated or not. Uh, and I think we need to nail that down, Jason. Um, I know, they, they, a lot of things. Will, they're not always and, instantiated. They are. They are sometimes uh, implicit. But then, That's like lazy coordinates. Like if you say molecule. And then a list of three carbons and a list of two bonds. I will assume that there are that each of those uh, carbons has a certain number of implicit hydrogens, but they're not in the actual list of atoms. Um, guys, unfortunately, we have run out of time, which is really a shame because there's a lot of fascinating stuff here. Yeah, we could go on for days. Yeah, well, we, we do need to do that. I mean, at some level, we will we'll need to probably schedule some some bigger blocks of time here because yeah. I mean, we're making good progress. I think um, it's just there's a fair amount to do. I just want to point out this highlights thing. Doesn't isn't there a highlighted wrapper that is um, that we're using for graphs and for uh, images and things like that? Roger? No, there, there is a function. There, there, there's a thing called highlight graph and there's a thing called highlight image. Okay. And, and but I think that when I was looking at this, is I think that it should be. <clears throat> there is no other second argument for molecule plot, is there? Um, probably not. Yeah, no, no. no. So isn't that one of the key features of doing molecule plot to provide highlights? So it's an optional second argument. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I, I'm guessing that this is going to be, you know, often as you you may not use it, you'll just plot it, okay? But, but the second most useful feature, I think, is probably going to be highlighting. I'm, I'm guessing. I'm just, I'm, I'm not sure. And, and, and Roger, to add to that, labeling it, you know, I might want to put numbers next to some atoms uh, or arrows and things like that. Right, uh, we'll want to hook into the callout functionality, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but how will we do that? Because callout usually is symbolically put into the structure itself. Right. And, right. and I don't think we... But, but, but if, if you want to do that specifically, you know, if you want to custom do that, so to speak, you know, you, I want to do my plot and I want to label it just there, okay? Mm -hmm. Because for my article or my presentation, you know, this is my... This is the big cheese or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, 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 right. Okay? But then, then you, you can use those wrappers there. You know, you can use labeled or call out wrappers, but then you have to build the layout code underneath yeah. that, that actually does. It. You still have to do work, mm -hmm. you know, but but in terms of taking the, the user specification at a fairly high level and being able to sort of just specify exactly what you need, that is, is sort of clear how you would do that. And particularly if you make it an argument, it makes all the sense in the world. Okay, sadly, we have to wrap up here. Um, I look forward to continuing uh, soon. Um, okay. I'll see you guys later. Sorry. Okay.
Okay, bye. Bye. Yeah.